Welcome back to Physical Chemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in the past few videos in this playlist on real gas behavior, we've talked extensively about um, some of the major real gas equations of state that are designed to model real gas behavior when ideal gas behavior becomes invalid. And we've also done a bunch of example problems. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about another parameter called fugacity. And fugacity is going to be given by the lowercase f. Okay? Um, and so to understand fugacity, let's think back to a little bit of solution chemistry that you may have seen, either depending on your class earlier in physical chemistry or even in analytical. Okay, so here's an equation right here that you may have seen. If you don't, if you haven't seen this, don't worry about it. But Sometimes instead of using a concentration, that's what we use in solution, uh, we would rather use something called activity, which in the simplest terms is defined as an effective concentration. Okay, so concentration is literally, it is a defined number of moles dissolved in a defined volume of solution. Okay, so the, if you had, let's say, uh, two moles of glucose, let's say two moles of glucose uh, dissolved in one liter of water, then that would be two moles per liter. That is the concentration. It's really just math, okay? But sometimes the solution does not behave as if the concentration were two moles per liter or two molar. It doesn't behave that way. And so if we want to think about not just the mathematical how many moles are, are, are dissolved in a given volume, if we'd rather think more about the behavior, the, the real behavior of that solution, then we have to use activity, okay? So activity is a quantity that uh, comes from concentration, um, but it takes into account things like ionic strength, um, something that's neglected when you're just doing the simple mathematical moles per liter, okay? And the way that you actually get the activity uh, which still has the same units, by the way, it's still moles per liter, but it's more of a real quantity, is you multiply the concentration times this gamma. And this gamma, uh, which you won't see the solution here, I just put that so you know what it's for, this gamma is called an activity coefficient, okay? So the activity coefficient almost always is a number less than one, at least for solutions, um, and you multiply this number times the concentration and it gives you the activity. And when you're dealing with real solutions, with real solution behavior that's not ideal, uh, activity is usually preferred, okay? Um, in fact, when you measure uh, the pH of a solution, in like biochemistry, let's say, what the pH meter is actually measuring is the activity, not the actual concentration, because it's actually looking at the real behavior of the solution, okay? Now, the gamma, this activity coefficient, you end up looking in a, up in a table. Um, generally speaking, an analytical textbook, a PCHEM textbook, they're going to have these uh, values tabulated. At the end of this video, I'll show you how to actually calculate uh, a theoretical activity coefficient. So this activity equation, activity equals the activity coefficient times the concentration, that's for solutions. And it turns out that we have a homologous equation for gases, for real gas behavior. But gases we don't talk about in terms of concentration, we talk about in terms of pressure, okay? And so uh, pressure is, the, is analogous to concentration in this equation. And if we take the pressure and we multiply times this gamma, this is for gases, this is called the fugacity coefficient, okay? Fugacity coefficient. And if we multiply that times the pressure, we get a quantity called fugacity. And fugacity is very similar to activity. So fugacity is an effective pressure an effective pressure that takes into account both repulsions and attractions within the gas. Okay, a simple pressure uh, does not take that into account. If you were to, you know, if you were to calculate the pressure, if you were to calculate it, um, pressure is just overall force per unit area. Okay, and you can calculate pressures using the ideal gas equation, right? But if you know that your gas is behaving in a real manner, so it's not ideal, then you can take that pressure you calculate, multiply by an appropriate fugacity coefficient, and get a fugacity. And perhaps the fugacity will be a better representation of the pressure because it takes into account uh, things like attractions and repulsions. Okay, 
Now, um, this first equation up here, the fugacity equals this coefficient times pressure, we can rearrange that and give you an alternate form of this equation where the fugacity coefficient is simply the fugacity divided by the pressure. Again, I just got that from this first equation by dividing both sides by pressure. So in some case, you may be asked to simply calculate the fugacity. Okay? Um, we'll do an example of these in the next video. But what you would do to do that, to calculate fugacity, is you would calculate the pressure using some gas equation, probably the ideal gas equation. You would probably be given, either given the fugacity coefficient, or you'd have to look it up in a table if it's homework, multiply those two together, and then you'd have your fugacity. So that's one kind of very simple problem that you can have with fugacity. But there's a lot more um, conceptual things for the purpose of physical chemistry that are more important. And we're going to kind of think back to when we talked about the uh, compression factor Z. If you need more detail on compression factor, go back and watch that video earlier in this playlist. But remember, in a gas, when attractions dominate, remember that the uh, compression factor Z is always less than one when attractions dominate within the gas. Okay. Now, in this context, that implies that fugacity is less than the pressure. Okay. So, let's think about what it means for a fugacity to be less than a pressure. Well, the pressure is just what you calculate, and you probably calculate it using the ideal gas equation. Okay. The effective pressure, the real pressure of how the gas is actually behaving, is less than what you calculated. So if the actual pressure, the, the way the gas is actually behaving, which is the fugacity, is less than a calculated theoretical pressure, then that would imply that there's more attractive forces within the gas. Because remember, when there's more attractive forces, that causes the particles in the gas to collide with less force. So their collisions have less force. And so less force means actual less pressure. So when the fugacity is less than the pressure, that implies that attractions dominate. And along the same lines, when repulsions dominate, the fugacity is greater than the pressure. So again, let's think about what that means. So if we calculate a pressure, but then we determine the fugacity, and the fugacity is actually greater, meaning the gas is behaving as if it's actually a higher pressure than what we calculated theoretically, then that implies there's more repulsions within the gas. And if you think about that, that repulsion, that net repulsion between all the particles, would cause them to collide with more force. So more force of collision overall means more pressure. And so when the fugacity, the way the gas is actually behaving, is greater than the theoretically calculated pressure, then you have more repulsions. And so depending on whether or not uh, your fugacity is less than or greater than your pressure, you can also tell um, whether or not attractions or repulsions dominate. Okay, And this gives us a second way to actually do this apart from using the simple compression factor. Okay. And there's a couple other things that we can, can look at uh, in addition to this. Um, when attractions dominate, we said Z is less than 1, and then the fugacity is less than the pressure, but that's also going to imply that the fugacity coefficient is less than 1. Okay? Uh, the fugacity coefficient is always a positive number, but it can be less than 1, and this actually makes sense in this case. For the fugacity to be less than the pressure, then you'd have to be multiplying the pressure by a decimal, like 0.8 or 0.9 or something, something less than 1 to cause the fugacity to be less. Okay, so you can also tell whether or not attractions predominate uh, if the activity or the fugacity coefficient, excuse me, is less than 1. And also in this case, uh, the real energy, this G is for free energy, but the real energy of the gas is actually less than what it would be if it were ideal theoretically. And the energy is actually less than predicted because there's more attractions. Attractions create lower energy systems. Okay. And now back to repulsions. Again, we said Z, the compression factor, would be greater than 1. The fugacity would be greater than the pressure. And along the same lines, the, the fugacity coefficient is going to be greater than 1. And this, again, makes sense because if we want the fugacity to be greater than the pressure now, then the pressure would have to be multiplied by a number greater than 1, such as 1.1 or 1.2. And multiplying that times whatever number the pressure is would give you a greater fugacity. Also, the real energy, so the actual how the gas is behaving, its energy is greater than what we would calculate theoretically um, from ideal situations. And the reason the energy would be greater in the case of repulsions is because uh, there's 
repulsions and so there's more force of collisions that creates a higher energy system and so that gas is going to have a higher energy um, than it would if it had attractions dominating okay and again an important point here is that a simple problem is you can be given a pressure and have to calculate the fugacity and these can be interconverted using this fugacity coefficient which is our gamma so this that I've just covered is really the major stuff uh, to understand about fugacity and hopefully it makes sense it's very similar to the activity equation for solutions the fugacity is an effective pressure that takes into account attractions and repulsions within the gas and so this pressure this p is really just mathematical you calculate it using let's say the ideal gas equation but that pressure does not mean that's how the gas is actually behaving um, even though you calculate a pressure of let's say 10 bar the gas may be behaving as if it were 15 bar okay in that case the coefficient here would be 1.5 okay so again the gas can be behaving in a completely different manner than theoretically using an ideal situation okay so hopefully that makes sense now um, this part down here I'm going to go over, it may sort of be irrelevant for most people. Um, most of the time you would actually just look up the fugacity coefficient in a table. Um, you would also look up the activity coefficient for solutions in a table as well or be given either one. But I'm going to explain very briefly how you would actually calculate it. We're not going to do this as an example because generally speaking, unless you have a really, really mean physical chemistry teacher, they're not going to ask you to do this kind of problem. Um, it's a uh, Let's just put it to you this way, it's a calculus nightmare, okay? But I'm going to show you at least where it comes from. We start out with this equation. You can probably find it in your physical chemistry textbook. The natural log of the fugacity is equal to the natural log of the pressure of the gas plus 1 over RT, and we have to do this integral from 0 to P over DP, and that's the real molar volume minus the quantity RT over P, okay? Now, skipping the algebraic manipulation here, we can get it to this form right here. The natural log of fugacity equals the natural log of the pressure plus we integrate from zero to P over DP and this in here in the parentheses simplifies to Z the compression factor minus one all divided by P. Okay, now it'd be nice to get rid of these natural logs here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna exponentiate both sides. I'm gonna take um, exponential of natural log of F, exponential of natural log, their inverse function, so the, it goes away and just leaves the fugacity, so F. I can do the same thing on the right side. Uh, I can exponentiate this natural log of pressure. That just leaves pressure. And then I can exponentiate this integral. Um, it is addition here, but when I exponentiate a sum, it becomes a product. So now I'm left with fugacity is equal to pressure times exponential, or e to the, integral from 0 to p over dp of the quantity z minus 1 divided by p. And from here what we can do is we can remember that fugacity divided by pressure is the fugacity coefficient of the gas. So if I divide both sides through by the pressure, I would actually get over on the left side fugacity over pressure, but that's simply the fugacity coefficient, which in the end is equal to the exponential of, or e to the, integral of, from 0 to p over dp of z minus 1 divided by p. Now, conceptually, the way you would actually go about solving this is you would first need to determine what the compression factor is. Um, at this point, you would hopefully know what the pressure is, okay, because you have to integrate to P, so you need to know what the pressure is. Um, presumably, you would know the temperature, the real molar volume, and you know the gas constant, okay. Um, so you'd be able to calculate Z and subtract 1 from it. Um, depending on whether or not attractions or repulsions dominate, this Z minus 1 is either going to be negative or positive. So it can be negative or positive. And so you'll just get a number, and then you'd have to integrate basically over P dP. And when you integrate this, you'll actually get the natural log of P, and you'd have to integrate from zero to P. The reason I said this would be a nightmare at the beginning of the video is because it becomes an improper integral. And no one likes improper integrals unless you're a mathematician who teaches calculus. Um, and I'm not gonna show you that, at least in this video or the next video. Perhaps I'll show it one day in a separate video. But generally speaking, this is, you would not be asked to do this to calculate the fugacity coefficient, at least I hope you wouldn't. Um, but this is how you would do it. Um, generally though, you just look up this coefficient in a table. All right, 
Hopefully this video made sense to you and you got a good grasp of at least conceptually what fugacity is. We're going to do a few applications of fugacity in the next few videos. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.